Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrew. I'm from the ProdPet team. And with me is, there he is, Alex. Hello. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to be talking about tech debt. Um, if you are watching us in Zoom, uh, you can drop in your questions, which Alex is going to answer at the end uh, on the chat or the Q&A uh, little buttons. If you're on YouTube, this is our very first live stream. So please, I apologize, first of all, for the minor technical difficulties we experienced as I accidentally went live earlier. Uh, but I am also monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions for Alex, uh, you can drop them in there as well. Uh, super excited to have you here, Alex. Um, go ahead. Thanks for having me. Can you see the slides, by the way? Are we all set? Yes, we are. Okay, cool. Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for attending the webinar. So my name's Alex. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called StepSize, where we're building products to help engineering teams manage te technical debt. And uh, over the last six months, I've uh, interviewed over 200 of the top engineers in the business in all positions and types of companies that you, you can imagine as part of customer development. Um, and I've been doing, I've been working on products to help engineering teams ship better software faster for over four years now. And we, we were lucky to raise millions of pounds from top investors to finance that. And we're also lucky to work with and learn from some of the best software companies out there like Sneak or City Pantry. And I want to share some of these lessons with you today. So I'll first give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about um, so that you can go scroll Reddit if you decide it's not for you after all. I won't mind. It's okay. So we'll start by chatting about what technical debt is and how it comes into existence. Then we'll move into why managing tech debt carefully matters and what it's costing businesses. We'll then debunk some myths about um, technical debt so that we're all working with the right mental models. And then we'll talk through the tactics and processes and methods that I've seen these top engineering teams use to manage tech debt. And that includes like uh, things like the um, criteria to determine how much tech debt you can afford to take on as a business. I call it the tech debt credits call. And then we'll discuss the most important cultural characteristic for a healthy code base. Then we'll move on to how to create a tech debt budget so you can stop wasting engineering time on tech debt. And we'll finish with the processes that uh, you can use to deal with small, medium, and large pieces of debt. So let's, let's kick off with the, uh, the high level stuff. What is technical debt? Um, I assume all of you know the metaphor based on financial debt. There are many definitions for tech debt. Uh, most of which work really well, but this is just my attempt at simplifying them. So I think of tech debt as the code that was written yesterday that's a burden today. It's all that extra work, the unnecessary work that you need to do to get your software out of the door. And I really like this comic by a monkey user, which great, uh, does a great job at illustrating this. So this team is digging that tunnel so fast, but they forgot to get rid of all the rubble that they've dug out. And a bug is causing the, the water to leak into that tunnel. And they're stuck in there because of tech debt. They won't be able to do anything about the bug and they might even die in there. So that's tech debt and what it can do to a business. And now I'd look, like, like to talk a bit about why tech debt is even a thing and why we can never seem to avoid it, no matter how hard we try. And that's because, as Martin Fowler explains, software exists in a world of uncertainty. And in my opinion, Martin Fowler wrote the best blog posts about tech debt, and I encourage you to go read them. But essentially what it means is that um, tech debt exists because the code that we write to solve a problem is based on our current understanding of that problem. And it sounds obvious, but let's unpack it a little bit. Even if the perfect engineers found the perfect solution to a problem and coded it up perfectly, their understanding of that problem will evolve and it'll do so quickly but left unattended, their code won't, it'll just stay static. And so that means that our code will no longer be appropriate. And it happens all the time and much faster than you might think, especially in high growth environments. Now, something else to consider is that it's often the case that it can take a year of programming on a project before you understand what the design approach should have been. That's another quote by Martin Fowler from this piece on, on the um, technical debt quadrant that we'll review later on as well. And so, however, what I've learned is that the best engineering teams in the business do know how to handle such high uncertainty. 
and they use the right tools and processes, they continuously refactor their code that has accumulated too much craft, and they won't accept messy code as technical debt. So to unpack this a little bit, um, to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanna have a look at this technical debt quadrant that I mentioned, you might've seen it before. When I say that the best engineers in the business won't accept messy code as technical debt, I mean that when they take on tech debt, they aim for this top right corner of the quadrant because technical debt is not inherently evil. It's not necessarily a bad thing because just like financial debt, it's a tool that we can use to gain extra leverage and test ideas faster. Just like financial debt, we can take it on without being prudent, without being deliberate and without managing it carefully. And it will screw us over and we will go technically bankrupt if we do that. So that means that we should never get sloppy and accept any kind of incompetence as acceptable technical debt. We should be aware of the current best practices and use them. We should obviously write clean, readable code. And we should know that code left unattended will turn into technical debt. And the best engineering teams in the business have ways to handle the uncertainty inherent to building software and end up in that top right corner. Now, before we move on, I wanna talk about some uh, myths that we should debunk about technical debt. The first one is that tech debt is bad and no one should ever take any on. Well, this one's very wrong, unless if you're sending people to Mars, sure. But if you're building software where the cost of failure isn't high, you can use tech debt as a way to gain extra leverage, just like financial debt. And just as we discussed, taking on tech debt prudently and deliberately is fine. And if you have zero debt, you should truly ask yourself for why. Also, it's not realistic to um, expect to have zero tech debt in the code base because of entropy. So I skipped ahead a little bit here, but I'll tell you about entropy quickly. I, so the, the VP of engineering at uh, Carter, a guy called Ron Parages, who um, told me about this, is that he looks as tech debt as entropy in the code base. It just never ends. It's a constant struggle. So you should adjust your expectations accordingly. Now, the next myth, myth is about how tech debt is only engineering's problem. Now, this one is also wrong. Um, we'll talk about how tech debt impacts the whole company and some more about how company culture, particularly how PMs and engineers work together and how much leadership understands about tech debt um, and its, its approach to tech debt can impact how well a company is dealing with technical debt. Now, finally, a lot of people wrongly believe that managing technical debt will slow you down. And that one's super duper wrong. It's actually been shown that if you're managing tech debt successfully, you'll see your number of bugs go down and velocity go up if you do it properly. And I'll show you how that's done. Before we do that, I wanna tell you a bit about why you should even bother managing technical debt. Um, I'll give you the macro numbers first. So Gartner's research showed that unaddressed technical debt will double from $2 trillion to $4 trillion by 2024. And these numbers are so big that they're meaningless. So let's go with one that hits a bit closer to home. It's a long quote, but it basically says that companies that have a strategy to deal with tech debt will ship 50% faster. And if you think that Gartner don't know what they're talking about, consider this data point that Stripe, um, arguably the best software company out there, uncovered in their research, they showed that engineers spend 33% of their time dealing with tech debt. And what's interesting is that they say that it crushes team morale and costs company 85 billion per year. So that's, you know, all our businesses here. I assume that we all work at software companies. We're all concerned by this stuff. Now, how the hell can you end up with such big macro numbers? Well, it turns out that technical debt can slow down the entire engineering team within days or weeks, and it has repercussions across the entire business. So check this out. In software companies, if you have too much tech debt, it means that you'll get too many bugs, loads of performance issues, and too much downtime. So that will create more work for QA, more work for the SRA team, and it'll result in broken SLAs. So all that stuff tallies up to more customer complaints, which means more work for support, customer success and account management. And it all adds up to unhappy customers. 
So I've heard some version of this many times over these hundreds of interviews. People who say we'd be shipping twice as fast today if we've handled tech debt carefully in the past. And I'm sure you've all seen this happen too. Is you see a feature that you thought would be simple and take a sprint ends up taking the month. Now imagine this at global scale across all software companies. So now hopefully you see why it's imperative to manage tech debt carefully. And to get you started on that journey, I want to help you figure out how much tech debt you can afford to take on as a company. And unfortunately, no one's ever managed to come up with a mathematical formula to answer this question. But I'll give you a few pointers that you can begin to find an answer for yourself. The first question you can ask is, is the software you're building critical to your business? So like I said, I assume most of us here work at software product companies. So the answer is yes. But if you're building some system without which the company could function pretty well, and you're unlikely to get the budget you need to pay back tech debt. So bear that in mind before you take it on. And conversely, companies who live and die by their software products will manage or tend to manage tech debt very carefully. Next, you can ask yourself if the cost of failure of your software is high or low. If it's very high, you can't afford to take on the debt. And by very high, I mean life or death, right? You're sending people into space or you're building software that ends up in planes. Now, if the uh, cost of failure is low, you can afford to take on prudent debt and deliberate debt to gain extra leverage. By low, I mean users might find a few bugs, but no one will get harmed or sued. So ask yourself, how much does your team sweat when something breaks? Or am I in a highly regulated industry? Because highly regulated industries um, often have higher costs of failures. Not always, but it's a good cue. Next, you can look at your competitive advantage. Are you in a highly competitive market where all software is beautiful and flawless and your UI and UX is your competitive advantage? Or do you win because of how fast you churn out features? Or is reliability and security the be all and end all of your company? And you should manage tech debt in a way that plays into that, right? It's no accident that Facebook's cultural tenants was move fast and, and break things. Speed is paramount to how they win. So that bleeds into their strategy for technical debt. Um, figure out what's yours. Now, another big one that I've seen as well is is your company pre or post product market fit? If you're pre product market fit, you can knock yourself out with prudent and, and deliberate technical debt because a very small subset of what you'll end up building will truly matter, which means that you can throw a lot of code away, right? And write off some debt. You don't even have to pay it back. You just need to get your software in front of users, learn, toss away what didn't work and rewrite what did. Now, if you're post product market fit, you can afford to throw as much code away. You can't afford, afford to throw as much code away, sorry. And that's okay because you probably have more certainty about what you're shipping. So you have to maintain the code you ship so make sure you're happy, you'll be happy doing so. Next is something to consider about the size of your code base and the entire system, right? Can one human reasonably be expected to understand the whole thing? So if yes, tech debt will be easy to manage, you can afford to take more on. If no, you should be more careful because if you introduce debt in part of your code base where the bus factor is one and that engineer leaves the organization, you're toast. So like we'll see later on, it's important that you document your debt to avoid this problem. Next, you'll consider the number of engineers at the company, right? Tech debt is inevitable because of entropy as we saw. So if you have a lot of engineers shipping code and all introducing debt, you'll accumulate much faster than if you had a small team. Um, small pieces of debt don't seem like much, like let's say like naming conventions, but in that context, they add up very quickly. And on top of that, engineers are expensive. So if tech debt slows them down or creates more work for them, the company's racking up a serious bill and not just in engineering cost, but also in opportunity cost, right? Like how much more revenue would the company generate if it launched its key product a month earlier, if they didn't have so much tech debt and this stuff compounds. Now, the last point is about company leadership and whether or not they understand technical debt. If you go to them with a tech debt project, will they let you pay it down? Um, if yes, you're safe, take it on, you can deal with it later. If not, ask yourself why. There may be some problems to solve here and I'll tell you how when we talk about 
take that processes later on. Now, I, I, we won't do this now because we don't have enough time, but for each question, I invite you to write down if the answer implies that you can afford to take on high levels of debt or low levels of debt. And then you'll have a rough idea of how to devise your tech debt management strategy. Either you need to be super tight and not allow much tech debt in, or you can take a bit more um, liberties, a few more liberties. Now also note that you can adopt different tech debt management strategies on different parts of your code base, right? So for example, you might come to the conclusion that you can take on tech debt on your front end code because UI and UX bugs are tolerable, but that you can't afford to take on much debt on your backend systems because data um, resilience and security are key to your customers. Now, let's talk a bit about this last point um, that has to do with leadership. Particularly, it's more about company culture. It's this slide is purposely blank for dramatic effect. Um, I, it's crucial to understand that tech debt isn't just technical, right? It's about people. It's deeply influenced by your company culture. And to give you an example, if your engineers are never recognized for paying down debt and it doesn't advance their career, do you think they're likely to volunteer to address tech debt? Or if engineers get reprimanded at the slightest hiccup in the software by people who don't understand that tech debt can be used for extra leverage, do you think they'll, they'll take on any debt? Well, clearly no, they won't. So as we all know, company culture is a huge topic and I've gone deep into it. I'm about to share with you the one cultural culture you should focus on if you want a healthy code base. And that is ownership. I, I've heard it from many people, including Gareth, who's a chief architect at Sneak First, who told me that ownership is actually a leading indicator, indicator of engineering health and broad, more broadly speaking, code base health. Now, I'm not just talking about a hazy concept here. Microsoft actually did some research that we can use to quantify ownership. It turns out that if you analyze your git commit activity to see which percentage of modifications to each file in your code base were main, made by the main author of the code, you'll see that the files with bugs are the files where contributors made less than 60% of the edits. So in other words, Code ownership is a leading indicator of code base health. You can use it to predict where things will break and reverse the trend before they do. Now, I want to add a bit of nuance here so that we can draw the right conclusions. This research does not suggest that each file in your code base should be owned by one and only one person and that they're the only person who can work on it. That would put your bus factor in the risky zone. Ownership is a spectrum and it starts with orphan code which does not have a clear contributor and therefore no one is implicitly responsible for its maintainers. Now this is a bad spot to be in. Um, and it goes all the way to absolute ownership where only one person can modify the, the code in question. Now for each file in your code base, you want to be in the collaborative ownership zone where the main contributor made more than 50% of the edits, but not all of them. Now, we won't get into it today because we don't have enough time, but um, think hard about how you can foster a culture of collaborative ownership in your engineering team, because it is the best way to um, maintain a healthy code base as, as you go about your business. So you now have a rough idea for your company's tech grade score. We spoke about the main cultural driver behind tech debt. Now, I want to talk about technical debt budgets. Um, it's a very popular idea. You've surely heard it before. It's the idea that you should allocate a fixed proportion of your sprint to paying back technical debt, say 10 to 20% of your time. Now, how the hell do you come up with the appropriate number? Um, I get asked this question all the time. Well, it should change every sprint. And it turns out that it's not that important to explicitly pick the right number. But I'll tell you how you can think about it. Um, at step size, we like to think about tech debt budgets like SRE teams think about their site reliability goals. So, you know, site reliability is responsible for keeping software products up and running. But interestingly, companies like Google don't aim for 100% uptime, right? And that's because 99.99% uptime is enough for their products to appear supremely reliable to real world humans. That last 0.1%. 0.1% is exponentially more difficult to reach. 
and it simply isn't worth fighting for. So consequently, if this allows them, let's say 52 minutes of downtime per year, Google will want to get as close to that number as possible. And anything less than 52 minutes of downtime is actually a missed opportunity for taking extra risks and delivering more ambitious features to their customers much, much faster. So you can think of your tech debt budget like your site reliability budget, provided it's prudent technical debt that you're taking on deliberately and that you remain below the maximum amount of tech debt that you can tolerate before affecting your, your customers and your business, you should feel free to take more risks, even if you end up increasing the amount of tech debt, because that's how you'll beat your competitors to market. Now, this pseudo graph summarizes the idea. Um, sorry, I got ahead of myself again. You, you basically, you want to hover around the maximum amount of tech debt you'll tolerate and your tech debt budget can be in the red, you need to pay some back or in the green and you can afford to take on some more. And a simple way to define your tech debt budget is to identify the intersection of things you know you'll work on using your product roadmap and the parts of your code base that have technical debt. Then you pay off the debt that's in that intersection, but not outside of it. You scope out the work and you'll have your tech debt budget for your sprint, for your quarter, or even your year if your roadmap stretches that far into the future. But the key idea here is that you do not need to address all your tech debt right now in one go. You need to address the debt that's in the way of your key goals for the quarter or whatever period you select. It's fine to start with the week. Um, now, let's get a bit more practical and talk about how you can incorporate tech debt management into your day-to-day -day agile development process. The first question that should be asked of any tech debt is, is this a small, medium, or large piece of debt? Now, small debt is the debt that can be addressed then and there when the engineer spots it in the code base. And it is understood that it's part of the scope of the ticket that they're working on to fix it. It could be refactoring a function or two. It could be renaming some variables, anything that's sort of localized like that and they can do quickly. And the best way to think about it is to follow the Boy Scout rule. Uh, you've probably heard this one before as well. It's uh, the idea that you should always leave the code better than you found it, right? And small jobs like these don't require any kind of planning and each engineer should feel empowered to fix this kind of debt without anyone's approval. So you see ownership is key again here. Now the medium pieces of debt is the debt that can be addressed within a sprint. That's how I like to think about it. Um, this debt should go through the same sprint planning process as any feature work and it should be considered just as rigorously. And that's actually where most engineering teams fail. Um, I spoke about this with a guy called James Rosen, who's an engineering manager at a company called Everlane. And he told me this, he explained, you know, consider how much time PMs spend curating the set of features to work on. And now compare this to the amount of time and effort that engineers dedicate to making the business case for tech debt. Is it that surprising that close to zero engineering capacity gets allocated to tech debt? In most companies, it's not. And you know, business rightly prioritize work that delivers value to customers. And at first glance, to people who don't know about it, getting rid of tech debt won't do that because it doesn't result in you know, a modification of the UI that you can actually see and, and sort of touch. But as we discussed earlier, tech debt does hinder your capacity to deliver value to customers in many, many ways. And companies need to identify these key pieces of debt that get in the way of key goals and that cost countless engineering hours in productivity losses or another root cause for the nastiest bugs and other issues that impact the, their customer experience. But most companies remain blissfully unaware of that and just bear the enormous costs of tech debt without even realizing it um, or that they could do anything about it. So in order to fix that, engineering teams need to document their debt and the problems that it's causing carefully so that they can then quantify its cost to the business. And only then will they be able to make a proper business case for any given piece of debt, for addressing that debt and, and you know, prioritize things properly. And this is where tooling has failed us so far. Unfortunately, um, another guy I spoke to called Jake, who's a lead engineer, and a company called Oncall told me that he's found that Jira is, the, is a great place to manage projects, 
but a terrible place to track and monitor tech debt. Uh, some of you might have tried this to sort of create a big tech debt epic where 7,000 tickets of your engineers uh, that they log diligently just go to die until everyone gives up on the idea. Um, and code quality tools are actually very helpful at surfacing one facet of tech debt, but they won't catch most other types of debt. You know, think about um, a code quality tool that tells you that your function is too complex. It's very helpful. It won't tell you that your architecture is no longer um, appropriate for the job there. Now, fortunately, that's exactly what our new product is for. I'll tell you about it at the end, but um, engineering teams have limited time to deal with tech debt and need to make it count. It's just a fact of life. So at step size, the product we built helps them capture and track that debt from their workflow so they can quantify its cost to the business and ultimately prioritize the most important debt. And a, make, a, you know, a good way to make sure that engineers pick up these new habits and that these processes keep running smoothly is for engineering teams to run a tech debt retro every couple of weeks where they review the new debt that's been reported. They can document any missing pieces and decide which tech debt is most important to bring up during the next sprint planning session. Um, then the goal will be to essentially uh, scope it out and add it to the stories for that sprint. Now, remember that you want to create a culture of ownership. So make sure that the team lead understands that they own this part of the process and that each engineer is responsible for reporting, documenting and costing the debt that they come across. Now, during sprint, sprint planning for each feature, you can simply ask, is there an opportunity to address tech debt as part of this feature work? or which tech debt could, be, could we address to make delivery of this feature smoother and faster? And then you actually scope out the work, you create a ticket and you add it to your sprint. Um, you need to have conversations about tech debt in your usual sprint ceremonies if you want a chance at creating the right culture and managing it. And lastly, we have the large pieces of debt, and that's the debt that can't be addressed right then and there, or even in one sprint. Um, the best companies I've interviewed, interestingly, all have a quarterly technical planning session in which all engineering leaders participate, even sometimes product. And engineering managers are tasked with bringing up large pieces of tech debt that their team leads have reported to them and to make the business case for the ones they judge to be most important. Let's talk a bit about that. The um, business case includes implicitly stating things like which key items on your roadmap would be impacted by the debt in question. Uh, if the debt was likely to get worse if left unattended and why? Because you know many engineers will ship lots of code in, in the part of the code base where the debt is, so it's more impactful to fix it. You can then wonder how much engineering time this debt has cost us so far and you can include an estimate of how much it'll cost it in the future by extrapolating that, that data point um, if you have an idea of how much work you're going to do in this part of the code base. And you can also do the same thing for which major bugs or outages or UX issues or just general quality problems were caused by this debt and extrapolate. Now, again, this process sounds laborious, but it becomes very easy with the right tooling. So for step size users, um, their individual contributors have been reporting debt from the front lines regularly in their editor, for example. This data is consistently reviewed and groomed by each team and their leaders who relay large pieces of debt along with the data necessary to understand what has cost the business to their engineering managers. And the EMs can then use their understanding of the company's broader priorities and, and vision to prioritize large pieces of debt accordingly. And once engineering leadership has approved each large piece of debt, they can be scheduled onto the roadmap, just like feature work, right? That's the idea, just have it go through the same channels as feature work. And to make sure everything is, is going according to plan, um, we built features for engineering leaders that, to monitor progress on each of these pieces of debt directly in step size. So, we're almost done. I just want to give you the very high level takeaways from this session. Um, if you leave with anything, I'd like you to remember that tech debt is inevitable. It's not that anyone's doing a bad job. Um, it's mostly due to entropy in the code base, which is just a law of the universe. Um, importantly, you can use tech debt to gain extra leverage and beat competitors, but only if you do so deliberately and prudently, and if you understand the levels of tech debt that you can bear as a business. 
And however, if you don't manage tank debt carefully, it'll come back to bite you. And, and the best way to manage tank debt properly is to create this engineering culture that's focused on ownership, like I said, and to include tech debt in your agile processes. And of course, to use step size. So I'll show you quickly what it's about, but um, unsurprisingly, we built a SaaS product to manage tech debt. And with this product, engineering teams can identify tech debt that will get in the way of their roadmap and address it before it actually does. So it integrates with the tools that engineers use so that they can report that debt directly from their workflow and cost it without ever leaving, say, their editor or GitHub or Jira. And engineering and product leadership can then use this data to prioritize the right pieces of debt in Jira, for example. So we're currently in private beta. You can sign up at statsize.com to start a free trial right now. And please remember to mention ProdPad when you fill up the sign up form. Thank you very much for listening. Now let's move on to the Q&A and I'm going to have a, a glass of water because I am, I am parched. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, if you're watching in Zoom, just a reminder that you can type your question uh, in the Q&A tab. For me, it's below. For you, it might be anywhere else. Um, and if you're watching this live on YouTube, uh, you can also just drop in your question uh, on the chat. Um, I'm monitoring that too. Uh, we do have our first question coming through, which is, um, I've heard the phrase, refactor your code base. Uh, in such a way that adding the requested feature is easy. What are your thoughts about that? Can you please repeat this one, please? So refactor the code base in such a way that adding a new feature is easy. That, that's yeah. the question, right? Thoughts that's about the that. question, yeah. Um, it sounds a lot simple than, simpler than it is, right? Because um, if you, and let me just hide the self use so I'm not staring at myself. Um, if you start pulling on that thread very often, you'll start finding dependencies all across the code base. And I know that we want to design things in such a way that they're not coupled, but that's unfortunately um, rarely the case in practice I've found. Um, so, you know, if it's a little refactoring job that you can do, like we spoke about uh, small pieces of debt that you can do right then and there, because it just concerns this function that you're looking at right now, by all means, go for it. Otherwise, I would have it go through the uh, sort of usual planning processes, um, sprint planning, if it's a piece of debt that can be, you know, you sort of find the edges of that debt, right? And then you, you scope it out and you have it go through, through sprint planning and you plan it accordingly. And if it's unfortunately bigger than that, you're going to have some big decisions to make, right? Um, you know, it, it, things like upgrading to a new version of Ruby in a massive code base can be a year long endeavor or even more. And that obviously requires input from many parts of the business because you have resources that would be um, used otherwise, uh, somewhere else otherwise. Um, so yeah, that's, these are my thoughts. It's, it's a lot easier than it seems, but if you, uh, sorry, harder than it seems, but if you break it down into small, medium, large pieces of debt and follow these processes, it gets easier in my opinion. Excellent. Um, the next question is, do you feel like quantifying tech debt in business terms? I think that means money <laughs> yeah. creates an asymmetrical relationship between business and engineering. Um, that's a good question. I typically, typically say that it helps business understand what technical debt is about. It's actually really hard to put a, say a dollar amount on a piece of debt, but if you somehow manage to do so, let's say it's cost us this many engineering hours, the average salary, uh, you know, hourly salary for our engineers is this much, it's cost us this much money, it's delayed us by this much and revenue in that period would be this much. If you manage to do that, I'm pretty sure the business leaders will get tech debt like this, right? But what often ends up happening, I find is the opposite is that engineers, rarely find this shared language to be able to communicate what tech debt is about with the business side of the company. And I keep, you know, putting, when, when, I'm, when I, I answer these questions, I sort of imply that the onus is on engineering to own tech debt and to make the business case for tech debt because it is, they're the people who you know, suffer the consequences of it and fix it and create it in the first place. They just, have to be the people who, who take the lead on that front. You can't expect business to just figure it out and do the right things for tech debt if you can't um, you know, communicate um, what should be done about it with them. And, and part of communi communicating it is finding the right language. And I actually think if you somehow manage to put it in dollar terms, um, I bet that you'll have 
better conversations with the business side. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, is there a point, I like this one, is there a point in tech debt where you decide to just rebuild uh, yep. instead of repairing the tech debt? Yeah, um, ideally you don't want to get there, um, but there are several scenarios, right? There's this term that we call technical bankruptcy. So you just you know, look at the piece of debt, you scope it out, and it turns out that it would be longer to fix this thing than to rebuild it in some better way. Well, in that case, just rebuild it. You know, it'd be a waste of resources um, otherwise. Um, you often end up in this situation when you're shipping some MVP or some quick thing to test an idea, right? You just want to find out if this feature is vi viable and you want to stick it in front of users. And once you, you, know, you do so in, in somewhat of a dirty way, and once you've done that and you've assessed whether or not it's been useful, you can decide whether to just throw it away and, and rebuild it. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, with companies that have been, especially companies that are growing really fast or have been going for a long time and are built on an older stack, um, if they don't have a strategy to manage tech debt, they sort of inevitably get to this situation where once every five years, they have to do a big rewrite. It's, that's typically how, how people go about it, but in my opinion, is, is not the right way to do things. Cool. Uh, we have another one here. Uh, as a product manager, how do you approach engineers who define tech debt uh, as code written by engineers no longer in the company? Yeah. Um, I'd say it's one type of debt. Um, and there are ways to avoid it, right? If the code base is well documented, or even if, if the code is just um, easy to understand and therefore pick up by someone new, um, if these things were the case, they wouldn't be in this situation, right? So I think it's all well and good to categorize code that was written by someone who left as technical debt. Now, remember that not all technical debt needs to be nuked right then and there, right? Maybe the answer is not, let's rewrite this thing, but the answer is, well, why don't you take a day to document it properly because we're gonna ship features on this thing for the next quarter, and I bet you're not the only person who, won't, um, who doesn't know this code, right? So that, that's how we think about it. I don't know if it answers your question, but that's just where my mind went. Uh, yeah, let us know that answer your question. If not, <laughs> we can, you can ask it in a different way, perhaps, and we can go back to it. Um, how can a team find arguments to actually get the time to really start calculating the costs of tech debt if management is not yet convinced about it? Yeah. Um, the way we've done it with companies we've worked with is by getting a team on board who will use, say, our editor integration to be able to report small pieces of debt that they find sort of all day, every day when they come across it. And because it's in the workflow, it's super simple for people to just, you know, send it to the web app, you know. And then you end up with all of this data about your technical debt that's been neatly quantified without even having to invest any amount of time, right? So the way you do it without management approval is you just you sign up to step size and you start doing it without telling them. And then you'll be able to make that's the case because you'll sneaky, have some data. It? <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, how, that's how engineers adopt tools, right? You just kick the tires on a thing and if it works, you, you then make a case for everyone else using it. But um, otherwise you just get started by yourself. You show it to your colleagues, you say, hey, uh, hey team, we've, we've, you know, I've managed to document all this debt using this product and I found so far that it's probably cost us this much. And, I think that if we all started doing this, we'd have the debt documented and costed in no time. And then we can go to management and convince them that we really do need to toss this thing away or, or you know, refactor this part of the code base or just get more time as part of sprints to be able to deal with it. Fair. <laughs> uh, we've got another one. Uh, what are your thoughts on things like upgrading a library uh, to the latest version? Would you consider that to be a form of tech debt or just regular engineering tasks? Yeah, I would lump it in there. So tech debt is one of these very broad terms, right? I mean, you remember the, the definition, right? Code written yesterday that's a burden today. You can lump almost anything in there. Um, the reason I say I would put it in, uh, in, the, in the sort of tech debt category, which by the way, tech debt is normal engineering work, um, is um, relating to this idea about entropy, right? If you, if you just stop touching your code base, 
and came back to it two years later, I doubt that you'd even be able to spin up the whole thing because all your dependencies would be out of date. And that is a form of technical debt and it has bitten companies before. Um, there are great tools to help with that. Um, you know, even identifying vulnerabilities in your dependencies like um, Sneak, for example, um, you know, plugging in little things like this in the code base will definitely help with this type of debt. Excellent. Um, I had one that was really good. Uh, here we go. Uh, where do you recommend uh, to get started if there's already a fair portion of tech debt going on? Yeah, I would pick up the product roadmap and look at the most important features in there and just map that onto the code base because you want to address the debt that's in the way of your key strategic imperatives right now. So, you know, no need to wonder about the year, the quarter, whatever it is. Just, just look at what you're going to be working on next week. Um, extrapolate a little, see if it's um, going to be something that people are going to be working on on a regular basis. And if it is, I don't think you can lose if you address this debt. It'll pay off in the long term. Cool. Uh, we have a lot of questions, which is great. Thank you, everyone who's on Zoom. Um, and again, if you're on YouTube, uh, drop your questions uh, in the chat and we can pick them up as well. Uh, what is a good way for an engineer to document tech debt um, to get uh, buy-in uh, from products to tackle the issues? Yeah, okay. I'm, I think I'm just going to share my screen and show you because it'll be easier this way. Uh, up. I'll pick an example from uh, step sizes tech debt. So I'll show you um, step size on step size, which gets a bit meta. Up, there we go. Can you see the web app, the browser? Uh, yep. Okay, cool. So for any big piece of debt in your code base, we call them technical debt item. You can put together a simple document, even if you don't use step size, right? Just put a throw a Google doc together with a title that describes the tech debt succinctly. And then you can answer a few questions for yourself to start making the business case. Um, there are some obvious ones like where's the debt located and you know, which parts of the code base or how impactful would it be to deal with that debt? You can kind of scope it out a little so you understand how hard it would be to address it. And then there are extra things. Sorry, I think my cat's meowing, so never mind. There's some extra things that um, you want to look at. Like, is the code going to get worse if we keep shipping? If the answer is yes, um, you know, you might be better off dealing with it now rather than later. Or um, which features are impossible because of this code? And you know, if you get started with a document like this, you're, you're already doing better than most people. Um, what I mean when I say that with step size, people can report debt from their workflow is that this stuff, you know, comes from um, something that was mentioned by Matt, my co-founder and CTO, directly from his code editor. There are other reports that come from GitHub code reviews or even Slack. Um, and that's how we end up having this data about the impact that a piece of debt has had on the business. But you can sort of guesstimate these things even without a product and extrapolate and make the business case like this. Oh, super interesting. Thank you. Uh, someone just asked what your cat's name is. Just different type of question. <laughs> He's called Knox, the little black cat. I'll see if he shows up. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you Knox. Excellent. <laughs> um, how can a tester help developers uh, working on tech debt? Oh, that's a great Other question. than testing all the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I had a great conversation about this two days ago, actually, by um, someone, I forgot his name, oh, I'll give him credit later. Um, he was telling me about how fixing technical debt can actually increase the amount of work that QA has to do. Because if you start refactoring everything, you're going to have to start refactoring um, tests as well. You know, you're going to have to rework all this stuff. And so if the engineering team, and that's like one of the pitfalls of having a dedicated QA team that sort of tests after engineering has made all their modifications. Um, if engineers refactor everything, it brings up the scope on QA and they tend to push back on this stuff. And so the tech debt doesn't get addressed and you sort of stay in that vicious cycle. So I would say if you manage to have, if you have a dedicated QA team and can have a conversation with engineering um, as part of planning, maybe about what tech debt they want to pay back 
and which parts of the code base and therefore which tests are going to be impacted, you can then adapt your plans to be able to deal with that extra amount of work, which is totally worth it, right? But if you don't plan for it, it, it just gets in the way and then it doesn't get done and it messes everything up. All right, thank you for your question. Um, does step size integrate with uh, Azure? Not yet, unfortunately, but we're gonna do it. So you just sign up and you, you, if enough people yell that we should integrate with Azure, we'll do it over the next ones. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions pop in, but we'll give uh, people a few more minutes um, to drop in their last minute questions. Yeah, uh, sorry, I think there was some background noise earlier. I saw a few <laughs> comments pop up, but I didn't know what to do about it. We, we, we heard it, it was the sirens. I was a little bit concerned there was something going on <laughs> over there. No, I live next to a hospital, so we're lucky oh. we didn't get the helicopters. That would have been bad. That explains it. Um, <laughs> someone did ask earlier if your background was real. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately not. It's not that sunny in London. <laughs> it isn't. It's, it's raining down south as well. So yeah. not, not a good day. Um, excellent. I um, believe those are all the questions for now. Uh, thank you, Alex, so much for joining us today. Uh, mm -hmm. If anybody wants to watch this back, it, it'll probably be available on YouTube in the next two seconds because we are going live. <laughs> uh, so you can watch it back there and um, share it around if you want to. Um, thanks everyone for joining and thank you Alex again uh, for jumping uh, on with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And if you have any other questions that pop up, you can just email me at alex at stepsize.com. I'll be glad to help. Excellent. Bye everyone. Cheers. Bye.